Good evening. Welcome to Brass Tacks. I'm Zaka Jacob. Mohammad Sharik from Shimoga in Karnataka has been identified as the one behind the pressure cooker bomb that went off in Mangaluru. He's been identified as inspired by the terror outfit ISIS. He was planning to place the bomb in a much more crowded place before, through sheer providence, it blew up in the auto that he was travelling in. Is there a fear of spread of radical terror in the South? Something that many political parties and politicians have been in denial about? How is it that this man, who was wanted in at least two other UAPA cases, slipped under the radar of the agencies? We'll get to all of that and more in just one second. But first, the story so far. Four weeks, two blasts, both with an overlapping, sinister, bigger picture coming through. Mangaluru, Karnataka, November 19th. Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu, October 23rd. Blast in car then, blast in auto rickshaw now. Near a temple then, headed to a temple now. In both cases, bomb ingredients recovered point to a bigger terror plot in the works. This is the man at the centre of it this time, badly burned in the Mangaluru auto rickshaw explosion. Mohammad Sharik posing with a pressure cooker bomb in signature ISIS style. Police have been on the hunt for him since September in another case. Searches at Sharik's rented house reveal indications of a bigger terror conspiracy in the making. Gelatin powder, circuit boards and more used to manufacture crude bombs. Besides signs of links to PFI and to one Abdul Mateen Taha of the Al Hind ISIS module active in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. So Abdul Mateen Taha is also his and he is the main handler as of now as for our information of Sarik. His acts have been inspired and influenced by some terrorist organization which is having global presence. So it is due to that and uh, he has tried to learn this manufacturing on, on his own it seems. On to efforts underway to decode and under investigation bigger ISIS terror plan in South India. In Mangluru, Mohammad Sharik, Abdul Mateen Taha, possible threads lead to ISIS. In Coimbatore, Jamisha Mubin, the man who was killed, allegedly had close links to Zehran Hashim, the suicide attacker in the 2019 Easter bombings in Sri Lanka. Again, the ISIS thread. There's also a Kerala thread under probe, one Mohammad Azaruddin, who allegedly heads an ISIS module in Kerala and Tamil Nadu. The Mangaluru blast on Saturday and the NIA probe that's underway points increasingly to a bigger web of terror being spun for South India. <laughs> Has this vicious web been played down for too long? How urgent are investigations needed ahead? Is a larger South India ISIS terror design finally unraveling? All right, joining us now on the talking point this evening, S. Prakash, the spokesperson of the Karnataka BJP, Ashwarya Mahadev, spokesperson of the Congress Party, Dr. Tara Karta, as former director at the National Security uh, Council Secretariat, and Balvinder Singh is former additional director with the CBI. Uh, S. Prakash, let me start with you. This man, Mohammad Sharik, uh, who was accused in two separate UAPA cases before what happened in Mangaluru, uh, surely should have been on the radar of terror agencies, anti-terror agencies, the NIA and others, Intelligence Bureau. How is it that he was able to travel to Coimbatore, uh, to Uti, Nagarkoil, then Mysuru, where he was living for the last two months under a fake identity. Isn't that a slip-up? Well, well, last month, there was a bomb, a bomb blast trial in Shumaga, where two of these associates were arrested by the police. A timely arrest was made then. And this Sharik escaped from the police net. And uh, he was off the radar. Uh, probably he must have been off the uh, radar once his friends were arrested by the police. Subsequently, he has resurfaced in Mysore. Then to, uh, he has come with a, a bomb uh, with the intention of bla exploding it in a crowded place to Mangalore, which has uh, become a very sensitive area with series of agitations and disturbances in the in the coastal belt. The uh, this PFI ban and subsequent developments, well, probably that has motivated him to create some disturbances and uh, disturb the law and order, peace and harmony in the uh, district. 
and uh, no, no, fortunately no, no, mr prakash mr prakash even in a normal uh, case even in a petty crime if you are out on bail you have to report to the police station once a week there are restrictions on your movement etc here is a man who is wanted in two cases under unlawful activities prevention act which is one of the most stringent criminal laws in this country he is moving around freely although under a fake name fake identity and all of that but he's really moving around to five six different no, places before uh, this uh, uh, this blast happens in bangalore and sheer luck that this blast happened in an auto rickshaw when he was traveling alone god forbid had it uh, blasted off in a market or a railway station no it would have caused heavy serious damage to the life and property of the people i agree i don't know the uh, provisions uh, the, for the bail up bail the, when there was he was given bail i don't know what are the conditions of the bail when he was given unfortunately uh, he was arrested and UB, uapa the court gave him the bail i don't know now what grounds they believe that he's a uh, he is not a harmless fellow okay. and today he has been uh, again caught in a uh, terror activity let, let me ask uh, ashwarya mahadev there are there expected. are serious charges against this man uh, not least of course there was this sort of trial run if you will that happened in uh, shimoga it happened on the banks of the tunga river where two of his associates maz ahmed and sayed yasin both were arrested sharik was reported as absconding uh, there is now the cops are claiming in hindsight there is evidence to show that uh, he he was in contact with mateen ahmed taha who is a known member of isis al hind isis uh, he was managing the al hind isis activities in karnataka uh, and that he also had met jamisha mubin who was the main accused in the coimbatore blast which again happened a few weeks ago uh, and this man had traveled to coimbatore now fact is that radical islamist terror in south india is a very very real problem best exemplified by this man mohammad sharik he was moving around freely he was in touch with known terror associates and yet some people in 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 the south tend to believe that radical islamist terror is not a problem in the south good evening zaka i think first and foremost the government here whether center or state seems to be far more active in jumping to action against octogenarian uh, pastors as opposed to people who are actual real threats first and foremost i unequivocally condemn any act of terror irrespective of from which denomination or which side anything that invokes violence and creates harm in society is something that necessarily has to be clamped down upon and i think fundamentalist terror across the south is something that is spreading but the larger problem here is the very fundamental failure of law and order in this situation if a person has cases of uapa against them it is not a simple bail order for them to be moving around freely it is about a tracking and a monitoring procedure that has failed and especially in coastal karnataka which is so nascent along with shimoga as well and you know looking at the agencies that coordinate so much with the state government for other issues i wonder what happened in this case because situations like this if they get out of hand will foment far more communal and societal instability and you do realize this is the run up to what you are going to see as a very aswas is them okay state of elections in my state and this more than anything else is the government has to own up to how there was such a massive lack no but aishwarya mahadev the that point that bjp has been making states? is some political parties have been having a soft attitude on terror uh, some even having some kind of underhand covert political understanding with uh, some of these groups or at least the political wings of these groups uh, and that unless you take a bipartisan almost a political view terror is terror uh, you are not going to put an end to this problem zaka i completely agree and in coastal karnataka you see the ruling dispensation uh, hand in hand with an organization they recently banned you see two of their functionaries talking about how this organization that was recently banned you know that uh, is something that is very critical to their functioning you see rss bjp karyakartas also talking about the same and i think now that they've made this stand let us also hope that they do sit uh, firm on this resolve Okay let me let me get Dr Tara Karta in you know there the, there was a feeling that after the PFI ban that a large part of the activities of such uh, uh, such folks people like Mohammad Sharik and others uh, there will be a massive clamp down there is a, sig- a signaling of intent 
by the political administration, whether in the center or in the states, to go after these guys. But the fact, and again I keep saying this, it is sheer luck that this bomb exploded in an auto rickshaw where so far there are only two people uh, who have been injured. This could have very well gone off in a railway station or in a crowded marketplace. So it was sheer providence that it ended up far m less m impactful or far less devastating than what it could have been. Uh, is it time now for us to, you know, remove the political rhetoric from this? Yes, you've banned PFI, but that is only the first step. That is not a panacea to radical Islamist terror in South India. I absolutely agree with you, Zaka. The fact is we've seen a considerable, all of us, I think, are agreed that there has been considerable Islamic state activity in the South, in Kerala, the Kerala module leading on to Karnataka and elsewhere. And this has been there for some time. It's not just about PFI. It's about a whole, um, you know, a whole number of groups which are acting together. And this has come from areas in Kerala, which of course, which we know has been for years, been extremist. But in Karnataka, Zaka, the point is that this particular area has been viciously communalized even during the Congress era. I mean, let's not forget that. There, 1998, 99, there were riots. There, the, whole, the whole thing started sort of boiling up at that point of time. Mm. Subsequently, let's face it also, Karnataka, Karnataka has been the worst in terms of, you know, the burqa ban and so on and so forth. So if you choose to do such things, you can expect that an Islamic state entity will definitely come and use that place will use the kind of dissatisfaction that there is to create chaos. So it's your choice. It's absolutely, as you said, if you can keep the political aspects out of it, these are innocent people who are getting killed. These are troublemakers who are come, some of them who are there. And you want to stop this, you have to take the politics out of it. It can be stopped. Let, let me ask uh, Mr. Balvinder Singh. So two points that I'm, I'm curious about, and these were warning signs and how come you know, no one picked on these warning signs. One, there was almost, like I said, a test run of a bomb blast that happened on the banks of the Tunga River in Shimoga. It was an experimental blast. Uh, in fact, two of his associates were arrested. I don't know why he was not, when already he should have been under the radar of the agencies for two other cases under UAPA that he was wanted for. The second one, the fact that he was able to stay under a fake identity, or at least uh, use the identity of someone else and someone else's Aadhaar identity uh, to stay on rent in Mysore for a good two months does raise some very serious questions. It is, is it so easy to fake identities in this country, to fake Aadhaar cards in this country that uh, a terrorist can live as, a, as though he's a railway government employee? That's, that's, the, that's the ID of the person that he, uh, that he impersonated or that he faked. Uh, a government railway employee for two months in Mysore and from there he goes to Mangalore and this blast happens. Yeah, stealing the identity of persons is actually very easy. It's extremely easy to steal the identity, fabricate an Aadhaar card, change the photograph. Nobody verifies when they take a tenant that whether this Aadhaar card is genuine or not and they have no means of verifying it. And when it comes to your question whether operationally the police is equipped to keep surveillance over all people who have been identified to be linked with terrorist activity, I think we really need to upgrade our operational capacities in every state. And that's a problem we face everywhere. You know, if there are, there are hundreds of supporters, people who provide logistic help, it's not as if each person who is involved in a terrorist offense can be kept under radar all the time. It is operationally not possible. So ultimately, police agencies, with their limited resources, tend to prioritize it. And in that process, many people escape the net. So it's a question of uh, operational capacities, the manpower, the technical capacities, the technical capacity to keep surveillance. All those, I think we really need to understand that South India faces this problem in a big way and there is need for upgradation in every sense, human resources as well as technical upgradation. So, so where and is also the problem? Because we are, led to believe, we are led to believe that one part of the problem is also political 
certain political parties don't want to be seen as you know going overboard with these measures because it upsets a certain vote bank how much of this problem is political and how much of it is actually from a technological slash technical point of view lack of resources or whatever you were you were referring to because the the the, the spin that's being given is I that you know you. soft on terror is 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 the reason why we're seeing this in south india I fully agree with you that terror has to be above politics. You cannot have a, a political party supporting terrorism. And that, I think, is an absolute no-no. There is need for creating an environment in which we have no tolerance to terrorist or even sympathy towards terrorism in this country. You know, look at the profile of this gentleman, this person. I will not call him a gentleman. Mm. He's a BCom graduate. And if you yeah. look at previous cases also, profile of persons involved. Now, what is it that is creating an environment of indoctrination among educated youth? I think that question has to be addressed at the policy level. And how do we address this issue? It has to be addressed both at political level as well as at the intelligence and law enforcement levels. So that issue has to be tackled. But operational preparedness, <coughs> operational capacities have to be upgraded coordination between agencies we have to work more on it both between center and states as well as between neighboring states okay entire south india is affected for that matter entire country is affected no s prakash the the fact is that as tarakarta also said if in karnataka you are having this hijab debate sometimes halal debate sometimes um, you know are muslims safe in that state so on and so forth if constantly the narrative is this then some of these educated youngsters are going to to do end up doing things like mohammad shariq of course the fact that the security agencies let it slip needs a very serious investigation how is it a a twice uapa charge man was allowed to get out of their radar but the political argument that's being made is if you're constantly going on hijab and halal narrative then there will be a backlash to it and sometimes the backlash can can take this form also you know when pfi was banned BJP leader after BJP leader said, this is the biggest dent against terror. After that also we are having terror attacks. What was the motive for the cooker blast in Tamil Nadu? Recently a Koyamath, in the Koyamath, a similar incident happened. Was there any debate about hijab there? Was there any debate about halal there? It was not there. That The government there was not even willing to accept it was a terror act. And it took four days for the NIA to enter the investigation uh, arena. Why did the uh, Tamil Nadu government delay so much? There were several uh, several uh, uh, terror activities have happened across the country at several places. Do you mean to say only in Karnataka, only because of halal and hijab debate, this incident is is happening and it can, it is justifiable? And here in Karnataka or in India, unfortunately, the fight against terrorism is looked upon as a communal agenda. And political parties, they do not consider the life and property of the human uh, Indians are paramount, but they look at it as a World Bank is most paramount and they stand by it. They even create a parallel narrative that there is a saffron uh, terrorism in, in India. It is th it is this way they are strengthening the hands of those elements who are out to divide the na nation, who are out to create uh, disturbances in the country. No, and so, the party so be, be specific, party, be specific, Prakash Aure. Who who are you accusing of treating this as a vote bank politics? So who are you accusing that so for, many, for some many, people many vote many bank is more important political, than terror? Be specific tonight. No, I will not. I will not point out one political party. In many political parties in the opposition, are they jump to the support of these terror elements when the government takes a very strong strong measures? They even oppose the U.S. bringing U.S. act. They want a softer law for to try the uh, terrorists. They give certain several examples that the existing law is uh, inadequate to try all these terrorists. And why this mindset strengthen the hands of those elements who are creating problem for the uh, nation's I, I security. Sure Amade, without naming any political party, he is saying many opposition parties have taken this soft on terror approach as a result of which people like Sharik uh, tend to get away with it. Like if he was um, uh, arrested under UAPA and kept under watch of the security agencies for that case uh, that got registered in 2020, subsequently he got bail in that case, 
uh, but I don't know why he, he escaped the radar of the agencies. But the larger point that Mr. Prakash is making is that it is a, an atmosphere, an environment of being soft on terror that allows these people to think that they can get away with it. You know, Zaka, dodge and deflect seems to be obviously the BJP's playbook when it comes to having no answers for a breach and a serious security lapse. Because let us talk about the reality today. They have a government here. They have a government in the center. They're a double engine Sarkar. They have this huge push about somebody's 56 inch and red eyes about national security and how they're going to weed out any form of things that stand against national unity and is a threat to internal and external security of India and her borders. And you see that this is happening right underneath their nose in a state where they have a government as well. Mr. Prakash has no response for that breach or that lapse of security, especially when somebody who's in a UAPA case and also twice over should have far more surveillance and that has not happened. And today what he's going to talk about is people soft on terror. I'm sorry when it comes down to, if you're pointing at my political party, when you made these big fundamental fantastic moves of banning organizations, did the Congress oppose it? No. We said you should have done it earlier. If you had sufficient proof, why don't you do it earlier? Why don't you have far more you thorough exercises? And you have a double engine Sarkar to do it. They did it a year just close to elections for their own benefit. Zaka, their playbook is literally this. They have nothing to answer for their lack in national security. So they're going to make it an us versus them. They're going to make it a communal sort of debate. And that is what is dangerous in society. Okay. When you asked him that question... The fact is, when you create this idea of victimhood and vilification and ostracism, you're obviously going to push either side of the spectrum or whichever faith or religion, you're going to push people to be far more extremist. And this is a self-fulfilling prophecy in the way that they're acting. And the minute you paint it this way, you further vitiate these already sensitive areas and the BJP doesn't care because this is literally their only electoral plank. This is sure merely... A national okay. security failure on the part of this double engine Sarkar. No. And the BJP so, wants to paint it in a color so, and an so angle. Let me ask, that let me ask uh, Dr. Tara Karta. You know, we are given to understand by the police that many people, including this Mohammed Sharik, learnt about making bombs by videos that were shared on the internet. Uh, we are given to understand now by the police in Bengaluru that two batteries of 9 volts each, switches, wires, matchboxes, uh, and other material were uh, were ordered on Amazon. And anyone can buy these timer relay circuits that are required to make bombs on any online platform. Uh, the point is, I agree with what Mr. Balwinder Singh is saying. You cannot, you know, so, uh, have surveillance on every single individual of, sus uh, of suspicion. But if it is going to be so easy to make a bomb, you can look up for a tutorial uh, on the internet, then... How are you going to stop the next Sharik? Actually, it's Zaka, it's not that simple. I mean, the ones which you see on the net is lots of, which is probably why it exploded in the first place. I mean, there's nothing like online training where you have handlers teaching them, you know, face to face. That actually works. This online stuff, a lot of it is, is well, it's, it's not the best. But it is what I entirely agree with this uh, with the previous speaker that it's almost impossible, given the social media, given the kind of hatred there is, it is almost impossible. You can't really blame either the police or the security agencies. You can't. It can't be done, except uh, what you said that this person was already under suspicion. I would have thought that somebody would be keeping an eye on him. But the point is coming back to what Mr. Prakash said. You've seen an uptick in violent incidents in Karnataka. There is no way that you can get around that. Yeah. I mean, ever since that hijab ban and everything, I think there have been about 12 murders. And who are these people? These are innocent people being picked up. The violence, the hatred is stoked. Did the Congress do it? Yes, they did. And I entirely agree with Mr. Prakash also. You cannot give, you know, terrorism a religion. Terrorism is terrorism and it has to be handled as such. So the only way... Given that there is so much available on social media, given that there is so much of hatred being spread on social media, your only way to stop this, if both political parties, for God's sake, sit together and stop the stoking of, of hatred. Okay. And that is what needs to be done. M Mr. Mr. Balvinder saying, Sharik was supposed to have gone to Coimbatore in the first week of September. The Coimbatore blast, the attack that happened uh, on the, the BJP office there, 
uh, happened after that. Uh, he's also supposed to have obtained through another Aadhaar card, another identity of another person, a SIM card while he was there. Uh, you heard a moment ago from one of the speakers saying how reluctant the Tamil Nadu state government at that time, at least in the initial days, was giving uh, was in giving that case to the NIA. Uh, they initially dismissed that as a cylinder blast. This man had connections with the main suspect, Jamisha Mubin, who was killed in the Coimbatore blast. He's the prime accused in that uh, in that blast. He also had links with Mateen Ahmed Taha, who's said to be a member of IS, uh, Al Hind ISIS, and somebody who's living in exile in Dubai. If all of this was happening, if he had links to what happened in Coimbatore, if he had links to a known ISIS operative, how is it that he was able to carry out all of this? He was going around half, uh, halfway across South India from, from uh, uh, Shimoga to Mysore to uh, Aluwa in Kerala to Nagarkoil, Uti, Coimbatore, all over the place. And his movements went undetected. You see, I'll just repeat what I said earlier. There is need for upgrading our capacities to gather intelligence, both human as well as technical. You know, now in hindsight, we can talk about this individual. There will be many such individuals who are moving around, and we may not be having capacity to keep surveillance over those people. But what then is the, is the way ahead? Because obviously, like you said, there are budgetary constraints. Uh, there may be even political constraints, there may be logistical constraints, but we can't afford to have another terror attack. Like I said, it's sheer providence that this pressure cooker blew up in his face. What if this, uh, he was suc successful in getting this up to a railway station or getting this up to a crowded market? Yeah, it has been. Yes, I fully agree. It's a case of uh, the city being very lucky because this, in, and this blast may have occurred in a crowded area or was intended to be blasted in a crowded area. So there is a definite need for upgrading our resources. I don't think political uh, constraints exist. Most of the constraints are operational in nature and capacity constraints. Okay. Uh, S. Prakash, I'll give you the final word, Mr. Singh, saying that uh, capacity constraints, technical constraints, but not political constraints. So when, when you blame the opposition, uh, that's not quite uh, accurate. No. Blaming is a, it becomes a political. Whoever, if I blame or the opposition blames. But please observe, in the last eight years, the terror activities beyond Kashmir has reduced to a great extent. To a great extent. One, of, one or two minor incidents have taken place. Certainly, the, the vigilance against terrorism has increased. Several newer systems have been implemented and uh, investigation agencies, particularly NIA, are on their foot in Karnataka itself. For in the last one year, seven to eight suspected terrorists have been nabbed. They have been taken into custody by the NIA, Ramnagar, Shumaka, and even in Bangalore, they have, there have been arrested, arrest made uh, in, in several cases. Okay. It, it clearly shows the police are on, uh, investigation agencies are on track. And so this one incident, I agree, they should have been kept a nab on this this person. And unfortunately, the, the accident occurred and the uh, many lives were saved. Okay. Uh, S. Prakash, Ashwarya Mahadev, Mr. Mr. Singh and uh, Tarakarta, thank you for joining us. We'll see how the story plays out, uh, both in Karnataka and in uh, wider South India, because, uh, yes, politically speaking, the government did ban the PFI. And at that time, it was said that uh, that's a big dent on terror. But however small or however limited impact these smaller uh, attacks have, whether it's in Shimoga or whether it is in uh, Mangalore, what we saw, uh, we cannot depend on sheer luck or providence uh, that what could have been a larger attack got uh, uh, resulted in just a smaller one. Uh, because you never know. You never know about the next Sharik. You never know about the next Mangalore attack. It could be much bigger than what the one that we saw on Saturday. So let's hope and pray that our agencies as well as our politics is geared up for that. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, talking about terror and terror sympathizers, uh, the controversial Islamist hate preacher uh, Zakir Nayak has been invited by Qatar to be a special guest during the FIFA World Cup 2022. It sparked massive outrage here in India. Uh, why should someone who has defended Osama bin Laden in the past, 
be invited for the biggest footballing tournament, or at least the invitation seemed to have timed with the biggest footballing tournament in the world. I'm going to take a quick break when we come back. That story. Ends.